Before the live-action movies came along, few could argue that there was a single piece of Transformers media that captured the hearts and minds of children around the world like the original Generation 1 cartoon, which propelled the franchise into the mid-80s juggernaut it's still remembered as today. The development of the Transformers followed the model Hasbro had already successfully used for G.I. Joe two years earlier. Names, personalities, and a backstory were created for the toys by writers at Marvel Comics, whose West Coast-based media arm, Marvel Productions, then co-produced the animated series with Sunbow Productions, a company founded by the Griffin Bacall Advertising Agency to produce animation for their clients, of whom Hasbro was one. Early in development, the series was pitched to network television. In particular, CBS expressed interest in a series Bible written by animation veteran Jeffrey Scott, styled more in the Hanna-Barbera vein with multiple human kid sidekicks and a wacky robot dog. Fortunately, the decision was made to produce the series for syndication instead, allowing it to be aired on multiple stations and freeing it from the content restrictions a network would likely have subjected it to. A three-episode miniseries sped into production, featuring instantly iconic theme music by composer Anne Bryant, a cast made up of some of the greatest voice talent working in LA at the time, directed by the best in the business, Wally Burr, and animation from Japanese studio Toei, using character designs created by artist Floro Deary, some of them revised from earlier designs created for the animation used in the first Transformers television commercials. The original Transformers miniseries hit screens in September 1984, telling the story of Optimus Prime's Autobots and Megatron's Decepticons as they travelled from their homeworld of Cybertron to Earth in pursuit of new sources of energy to continue their age-old war. The three episodes introduced the majority of characters from the first year of the toy line, as well as the Autobots' human allies, Spike and Sparkplug Witwicky. But unlike with G.I. Joe, Hasbro didn't wait for the miniseries to air before concluding they had a hit on their hands. They commissioned a full season of 13 episodes to follow the pilot, which started airing on Saturday mornings less than a month later. Marvel Productions took the lead on the series, with recent arrivals to the company Bryce Malick and Dick Robbins assuming the role of story editors, and writer Ron Friedman taking the job of editing every single script, creating the unique language and voice of the cartoon. From mentions of Cybertronic fauna. What's a test without a guinea pigatron? She was playing Roboto Possum. Silky Retro Rats! To quirky robot themed anatomic euphemisms and insults. Let me go, you big light beaked buzzer! Brilliant, my boron compressor! Watch it, you metallic mini meatball, or I'll step on you! The first season establishes the status quo of the show with the Autobots defending the Earth against the Decepticons' attempts to pillage its resources. Much of the season comprises a loose narrative centered around the Decepticon's space bridge technology, culminating in the ultimate Doom three-parter in which the bridge is used to bring Cybertron into Earth's orbit. Memorable human characters like disabled computer expert Chip Chase and evil cyborg scientist Dr. Archiville feature in multiple episodes, and about half the season is given over to introducing and showcasing new toys from the upcoming 1985 product line, including perennial fan favourites the Dinobots and the Constructicons, the first team of Transformers able to combine with one another to form a larger super robot. For its second year, the series was moved into weekday syndication, airing five days a week, to be broadcast in this manner, a show needed to have 65 episodes, so to make up the numbers, the second season came in at a whopping 49 episodes in length. This season's more character-driven than the first. The rest of the new 1985 toy characters join the cast early on, mostly in the two-part episode Dinobot Island, although no explanation is ever offered for where they come from. And they quickly take center stage, with virtually every one of them receiving an individual spotlight episode showcasing their unique personality, resulting in many memorable stories that are often viewed as definitive takes on the characters. As it progresses, the season also begins to expand the series mythos by exploring the history of Cybertron and the origin of Optimus Prime, and adding key cartoon original characters and concepts like Prime's creator Alpha Trion, the life-giving computer Vector Sigma, and the first ever female Transformers, along with the Autobots' new human ally, Carly. In its final 10 episodes, the season also introduces the first round of upcoming 1986 toys in the form of the new Autobot and Decepticon combiner teams. All in all, it was a grueling high-speed process. 
Where today animated series can spend years in production before they reach the air, episodes of the Transformers could go from script to broadcast in as little as four months. It's just how cartoons were made back then, and the punishing schedule was the reason that episodes couldn't always be sent back for corrections, leading to the many animation errors that the show's famous for. Not that the audience cared, it was in this second year that Transformers truly exploded in popularity, and the cartoon was no small part of that. The adverts for the toys had always featured animation, but it was in 1985 that these ads also began featuring voiceovers from the cast of the cartoon, further tying the different parts of the franchise together. At the height of the series' popularity, the Transformers the Movie was released in the summer of 1986, which served as a turning point for the cartoon's storyline. The film jumps the action 20 years into the future, to the year 2005, and introduces many elements that would be key in future Transformers lore, including the monster planet Unicron and the Autobot Matrix of Leadership, as well as many new characters from the 1986 toy line. On the flip side, much of the 1984 toy line was discontinued that year, so those characters were phased out to make way for the new by having them killed in the film. Most significantly, Optimus Prime and Megatron have their final battle, but while Unicron recreates the wounded Megatron as Galvatron, Optimus dies and is succeeded by Rodimus Prime. The film concludes with the Autobots retaking Cybertron from the Decepticons, setting the stage for the 30-episode third season that followed just a month later. But a new setting and cast of characters were not the only changes for the show. Season 3 marked the shift in control of the series from Marvel Productions to Sunbow directly. Malik Robbins and Friedman were replaced with Sunbow staffers Flint Dilly, Steve Gerber and Marv Wolfman, and series producer Nelson Shin's South Korean animation studio Acom was brought on to cost-effectively animate half the season. With the Decepticons banished to the dead world of Char, the Autobots now no longer fighting to reclaim their homeworld, spend the third season working with humanity as diplomats and peacekeepers for the galaxy in a futuristic 1980s sci-fi vision of the 21st century. Inter-episode continuity grows a little tighter this season, with stories revolving around a small, recurring core cast. Rodimus Prime grapples with the burden of leadership, while the Decepticons grapple with Galvatron's loss of sanity. And the mythos grows even larger, with the addition of a third faction to the show in the form of the Quintessons, aliens introduced in the movie who were revealed to be the original creators of the Transformer race. But the new approach didn't sit well with audiences. Optimus Prime's death in the movie proved a significant misstep that prompted a huge letter-writing campaign from upset viewers, and the season ultimately capitulated to their demands, concluding in February 1987 with the two-part Return of Optimus Prime. The cartoon reached its end in September 1987 with a short fourth season consisting entirely of the three-part miniseries The Rebirth. Scripted fittingly enough by the cartoon's most prolific writer David Wise, it introduces the Headmasters and other new characters from the 1987 toy range, and though the war still rages as the curtain is drawn, it ends with Cybertron being successfully re-energized, bringing the entire series full circle. In Japan, however, they weren't ready to call it a day yet. An exclusive spin-off series, The Headmasters, was commissioned, which ignored the events of the Rebirth and continued the series in a different direction. Several further series would follow, building into a unique, sprawling, Japanese-exclusive expanded universe that's still being added to today. But we'll save that complex beast for a future Basics episode of its own. And the show didn't completely disappear from the airwaves in the US. Though no new episodes were produced, new ways were found to repackage select episodes for reruns. In 1988, a 20-episode long fifth season added original intros and outros from a live-action stop-motion Optimus Prime puppet. Later, in the early 90s, 52 episodes were re-aired with computer-generated scene transitions as Transformers Generation 2, promoting the toy line of the same name. The influence of the Generation 1 cartoon stretches across the length and breadth of Transformers history, still inspiring new toys, characters and stories to this day, from the loose sequel series Beast Wars, which featured return appearances by the original Optimus Prime, Megatron, Starscream and more, to the Transformers Collectors Club's Wings Universe series of comic stories, which continued the story of the cartoon universe in its own unique way. Actors Peter Cullen and Frank Welker have reprised their iconic roles as Prime and Megatron on film, on television, and in video games, as have several other performers from the original series cast. 
It might be over 30 years old and look pretty dated to new young fans, but from everything it accomplished back in the 80s to everything its legacy continues to inspire today, the Generation 1 cartoon remains, quite simply, one of the single most important pieces of Transformers media ever. And those are the basics on the Generation 1 cartoon. Did you watch it back in the 80s? Or are you a youngster who discovered it years later? You got a favorite episode, a favorite character? Let's hear about it in the comments. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more.